Let's open our Bibles then to Leviticus, starting in chapter 9. Tonight we will be going over Leviticus 9 and 10. I titled today's study, Jaw-Dropping Displays of God's Pleasure and Displeasure. When we walk in obedience, God is pleased. When we walk in disobedience to His Word, God is displeased. And in chapter 9, we're going to see God being pleased by their obedience. And in chapter 10, we're going to see God being displeased by the disobedience. But just go ahead and put your marker there for a moment. At this point in the book of Leviticus, Aaron and his sons begin their service unto the Lord and his people. Everything was made ready for them. The tabernacle, all the holy instruments being used. Everything was set up and ready for them to go, even them. Their clothing, they were trained, they were taught exactly what it was that God wanted them to do. And it was not showtime, but serve time. And the reality is that every true servant of God gets to a place where the rubber meets the road. The rubber meets the road. This is an old expression that basically meant it's time to put this car or these tires to the test. For us, like Aaron and his sons, it's when we finally put to practice all that we've learned from God's Word. They were taught, they were trained, and now they're putting it to practice, as we're going to read. And you and I are taught and trained by the Word constantly, and everything we learn, everything we hear, by the grace of God and by the power of the Spirit, we put it to work and we put it to practice, right? I've been teaching my son, Blue, how to drive lately, and soon he will have to take all that he's learned into traffic, where his level of driving skills will be tested. By the way, Blue is doing really good, and we haven't hit the big streets just yet, and I'm a little nervous when I think about it, but <laughs> the time will come. But he's being trained, he's being taught, he's being told what to do. This is how you slow down, this is what you do at a stop sign. Watch out for this and watch out for that. And so we're going through all of that and he is going to have to put it to practice here very soon where there's more cars around. So every time you come to church, every time you come to God's house to be fed, to be instructed, see, you need to understand that God's house is spiritual schooling. You're always being trained by God's Word. You're always being taught and instructed in regards to God's will for our lives. So every time you come and you are trained and then you leave this building, you exit this building, it is then where the rubber meets the road. Again, where everything you heard, everything you learn is put to the test. Obviously here first and then out there. But we're not here for nothing. And Aaron and his sons weren't there in the tabernacle for nothing. They were there to learn something and then to apply what they learned. And so it is for every Christian, for every believer. We come to be equipped to do God's work, to do God's will in everyday life, in ministry. Right? And we do everything as unto the Lord. Everything as unto the Lord. The question is, how well do we receive God's instructions? I'm going to find out how well Blue received mine here soon. But that's the question. How well do you receive His instructions? How attentive are you when the Word of God is being taught? Are you a sponge? Are you taking it in? Are you excited about what you've learned? When you hear something and you say, you know what, I haven't overcome that yet, but I want to. And by the Spirit of God, I will. And so then that's the goal, to receive instructions, not just to receive them, but in order to obey those instructions. The reality is this, the Christian's goal should be to learn and to know all that God has said. Why? To love it, to believe it, to obey it, and to share it. That's what this is all about. It is to draw near to God. It is, it is to draw near to God's mind. And God's will, what God wants for our lives. This thing is bigger than us, folks. We open this book and we've entered heaven. We open this book and we've entered the hallways of God's mind and heart. We enter this book and we're in a different world, people. Amen. God's world. God's mind, God's words are being spoken. And so we take this whole life to another level. 
when this book is open and preached. Can I get an amen? amen? So again, in chapter 9, we'll read about how a jaw-dropping display of God's pleasure. And in chapter 10, we're going to see a jaw-dropping display of God's displeasure. Starting there in Leviticus chapter 9. If you would open your Bibles there. Leviticus 9, we're going to read the entire chapter. May I get some water, one of the brothers, please? Starting there in verse 9, your subtitle may read, The Priestly Ministry Begins. It came to pass on the eighth day, pay close attention, that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish. And offer them before the Lord. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a kid of the goats as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish. Thank you. Without blemish. As a burnt offering, also a bull and a ram as a peace offerings. To sacrifice before the Lord and a grain offering mixed with oil. For today the Lord will appear to you. This was a big deal. They were getting ready for God to show up. In verse 5. So they brought what Moses commanded before the tabernacle of meeting. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. By the way, I would have you know that we're always standing before the Lord. No matter where we are, whether we're at home in private or at work with everybody else or in this place right now, we are always standing before the Lord. Six, then Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, go to the altar, offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people. Offer the offering of the people and make atonement for them. Now, atonement is basically a payment for sin. So anytime you read atonement, it's a payment for sin, as the Lord commanded. Aaron, therefore, went to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. Then the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood put it on the horns of the altar and poured the blood at the base of the altar. I already told you guys, when you think of the altar here in this scene, it, it's a picture of the cross of Christ. 10, but the fat, the kidneys and the fatty lobe from the liver of the sin offering, he burned on the altar. Why? Because these were the best parts of the animal. There were the choice meat and it was given to God, which is, it, as you guys know, God deserves the best. Can I get an amen? It says, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 11, the flesh and the hide he burned with fire outside the camp, which is a picture of Jesus dying outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. 12, and he killed the burnt offering and Aaron's sons presented to him the blood which he sprinkled all around on the altar. Then they presented the burnt offering to him with its pieces and head. And he burned them on the altar. 14. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. Then he brought the people's offering and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and killed it and offered it for sin, like the first one. And he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to the prescribed manner. Then he brought the grain offering, took a handful of it, and burned it on the altar, besides the burnt sacrifice of the morning. He also killed the bull and the ram as sacrifices of peace offerings, which were for the people. And Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled all around the altar, and the fat from the bull and the ram, the fatty tail that covered the entrails and the kidneys, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver. And they put the fat on the breast. Then he burned the fat on the altar, but the breast and the right thigh Aaron waved 
as a wave offering before the Lord as Moses had commanded. 22, then Aaron lifted his hands toward the people, blessed them, came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offerings, and Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They were shouting because God showed up in such a magnificent and impressive way. It was the sheer force of God's presence that caused the people to fall on their faces. In other words, it was as though their knees became water before the presence of God. And all they could do was bow before His presence. Now what's so interesting is this. When it says that they fell on their faces... It's the way in which one bows to the extreme before the Lord, where your face literally touches the floor. In other words, you get to a point where you can't bow any lower. You are prostrate on the ground. Your knees are straight. Your, your torso is straight. Your neck is straight. Your face is straight and it's touching the ground. You are flat on the ground. Have you ever done that? You should. To bow before the Lord, completely flat on the ground. If you don't like the dirty carpet, put a piece of paper between your nose and the carpet. That'll be fine. But get before the Lord in that way and bow before the Lord. Because why? He is awesome and He is worthy that we would just completely humble ourselves before Him. Now, it's not to say that you got to do that every time, but it is to say if you can do it most of the time, it wouldn't be a bad idea. It's just an outward expression of our all-out humility before God. I'm going to share a little something with you. The times that the Lord has put that in my heart to do that, i got to say those are the times that I felt most humbled in my heart. The times that my eyes broke forth like dam with dams with water just gushing out joyful in his presence just laying there prostrate before the lord like like i can't bow lower than this lord do it and you'll have some blessed times before the lord that's kind of what happened here they couldn't help themselves but fall on their faces you really need to get to a place in your walk with god where you can't help yourself but fall on your face. How does it happen? When you grow in the knowledge of His greatness. When you grow in the knowledge of His wonder. When you grow in the knowledge of His holiness. When you grow in the knowledge of His otherliness, which means there is no one like our God. When you get to that point, your knees will buckle and they will fold and you will bow as low as you possibly can. And you will love every moment of it, trust me. It says there in verse 1, it came to pass on the eighth day. By the way, in the Bible, the number eight refers to or points to new beginnings. New beginnings. After seven days of consecration unto God and animal, animal sacrificial training by Moses, here we find that Aaron and his sons get to perform the prescribed sacrifices found in chapters 1 to 7. So again, the rubber meets the road. Moses showed them exactly how to do it. In chapter 8, it's, it's Moses doing it, showing them how to do it, uh, do it, training them. But here they get to do it themselves. Before the eyes of their supervisor Moses and the greatest supervisor of all, God, who is watching. How good did you guys hear, Moses? How good did you take the instruction I gave Moses? Well, let's find out. And if you do the right thing, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up. And so we see that. They did it. He showed up, right? So they got to perform the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering, the grain offering, and the wave offering. For those of you who don't know what those offerings are, go back to our YouTube channel or Facebook and re-listen to those messages, all right? 
because I can't go over them now or we'll be here till next Wednesday and I'm sure you guys don't want that. So all of these offerings brought God and His people together in a very special way. That's what they were. All of these offerings pointed to the way the Lord Jesus Christ connects with us, starting with Him dying on the cross, the sin offering, right? The burnt offering, the daily offering, the morning and evening offering, which points to we, 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 we trust in Jesus daily, from morning to evening, evening and always, right? Then you have the peace offerings where we get to commune with God. At that time, it was like having a barbecue with God. So I'm telling you these things in short, right? And so then you have the grain offering where you just come and you give the most costly offering that you got. Why? Because there was hardly no grain there. So anybody who gave wheat to God gave the most expensive gift. That's why it was called the holiest gift, right? Because it was uh, very rare. Then you have the wave offering. This is, this is bringing before the Lord and, and offering Him your life. It's like when we lift up our arms and we just worship the Lord and praise His holy name. But all of these all of these offerings point to the way God connects with us and with the way we connect with God, right? So all of these things are very beautiful and very practical even today. Yeah, we're not killing animals, you know, big smelly things on our shoulders and stuff, but you know, we are praising God with our lips. We are working for God with our hands. And so we still offer to the Lord. But again, all these offerings point to the way God deals with man. The sin offering points to what? Jesus the Lord. These are animals that died in their place and for their sin. This is a picture of the Lord's cross. Again, the priests are now putting to practice all that they have been taught. This was go time. What were they taught? They were taught to worship God properly. We're living in a time today that people, many people don't know the Word of God. Many leaders don't know the Word of God. So they don't know how God ought to be worshipped. But they were taught. And true worship is made up of real love towards God, towards His person, towards His goodness. True and holy worship is obedience to God's Word. Right? It's um, all spiritual and physical service. So they were informed on what to do and how to do it. And I want you to know that you and I are informed on how to worship the Lord, how to obey the Lord. God's Word teaches us how to live and how to do ministry, this is where the rubber meets the road. Again, you guys are test driving them tires. You guys are test driving that engine, that spiritual engine that God has given you. Every time you leave this place, you hear the word of God, all right, I'm gonna do what God told me to do tonight. I can see Brother Ray at home. Linda, get out of the room. Gotta get on my face before God, right? That's one thing you can take away from this. But there's going to be many things that you can take away from this. Right? And so that's the point of it all. It's to take what you hear to practice. That is the most happiest Christian there is. The more you obey God, the more joy you experience in your life. The most joyful Christians in the world are those who obey God most. It's the way it works. You want joy? Obey God. Because in your obedience, He gives you His pleasure, His sense of approval. And your soul feels it. Like, I'm approved by God, right? God is happy with what I'm doing. God is happy with the way I'm thinking. God is happy with the way I'm speaking. You want to be a happy Christian? Put to practice everything you hear God speak. Amen? We could say that People are lacking joy in the world and in the church simply because they don't obey God. Why is everybody so sad? Look at their life. Is it lined up with God's will and word? That'll tell you the majority of the reason why people are so depressed. All was done under the supervision of Moses and God. This reminds me of Ephesians 4.12 where like Moses... Pastors, Bible teachers, and evangelists are responsible for equipping and training God's people through faithful teaching. That's what Moses did for Aaron and his sons. And by example, so it's by teaching and by example, living an example for the work of ministry and to grow in the knowledge of Jesus in order for what? In order for you to know the Lord better. 
in order for you to serve the Lord better. That's what all of this is about. Are you getting better in regards to your knowledge of the Lord? Is it increasing? Are you overcoming certain sins as you are growing in Christ? You're looking back and you're seeing growth in your life? I know you are. If you're in Christ, you are. And so this is the point of it all. Are you serving God? Are you using your hands for His glory? Are you using the talents and abilities and skills and spiritual gifts God has given you, right? That's why we're here. We're here to motivate you through the preaching of the Word. My role like Moses is to teach you. Your role like Aaron is to put to practice what you've been taught. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. Know the Lord, love the Lord, obey the Lord. That's what Christianity is all about. You want me to make it very simplistic? It's what it is. What does it mean to be a Christian? Know Jesus. Know what he said, know what he wants, know the way he is. Love him and obey him. That is the best Christian in town. The one who knows and loves the Lord with all of their heart. And at times we don't, but we grow in that too. Can I get an amen? One vital insight we learn here is that no one should serve in any official ministry until their sins are paid for by Jesus through faith, right? Aaron and his sons, their sins were atoned for. They were paid for. And they weren't able to continue in spiritual ministry and service unless they were both saved and consecrated for the Lord. So we need to understand that God doesn't accept service from non-believers. He doesn't. He will not. You cannot work for Jesus without the Spirit of Jesus living in you. And without the forgiveness that the cross provides an individual, right? I've heard of churches that allow unbelievers to join ministry so as long as they're talented, as long as they're skillful. Hey, can, can, you, can you play the guitar? How well do you speak in front of people? Let me hear you. And so the prerequisite isn't, are you saved? Are you born again? Have you consecrated yourself, meaning you set yourself apart from the world for the Lord, for His work? That's what these men did. And so many churches, I'm telling you, they're just looking for the skills. They're looking for the talents. They can care less if people are truly saved or not, or how people live. That doesn't matter. We're putting on a show. Can you add to the show? See how good you are. That's not the way the Lord works. Shows us here that Aaron and his sons didn't work for the Lord without being forgiven, without their sins being cleansed, and without them being consecrated and set apart for the Lord Jesus, right? And so there's so much to learn. I mean, just in these two chapters, we can go through a little series, actually, but I'm just kind of giving you the short version. But there's a lot to learn here, church. It says, to Aaron... Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering. We find that there in verse 2. We're going to learn a few things here too. We find here that Aaron, being the high priest, was sinful like everyone else. Aaron, the high priest, was sinful like everyone else. And you, are both are, you and I are both thinking, of course, he was the one that created the golden calf. We all know that. But there are times when people may think that spiritual leaders are sinless, but they're not. Every man is sinful. And this is the reason why atonement was made for him. A payment for his personal sin had to be made. By the way, I would have you know that this was done publicly. Aaron himself had to sacrifice the animal in front of everybody so that everybody knows that even the high priest needs forgiveness for his sin. This was God's way of showing everybody that the ground is leveled at the cross, right? There are different levels of, of, of spiritual growth and so on, but we all have sinned and we all even sin now, right? With our thoughts, with our actions. Some sin more boldly and flippantly than others, but we all sin and need forgiveness. Can I get an amen? And so that's, that's what we see here. He kills this animal in front of everybody to, for everybody to know that he too needs forgiveness. 
Every spiritual leader needs forgiveness. This shows us that pastors are not perfect. They are called to, they are called and expected to live higher standards than everyone else, right? Obviously, the high priest and his sons are going to live at a higher standard. Obviously, pastors and Bible teachers and evangelists have to live at a higher standard. But even then, they are still sinners. At best, they are still men and in need of forgiveness. Can I get an amen? And this is important to know because um, there are some men who flaunt themselves in such a way that people may think that they're sinless. A lot of the false preachers do that, actually. They call themselves the anointed ones, right? Don't, don't, don't talk bad about the anointed, you know, anointed of God or whatever. And so they put themselves on a, on a sinless pedestal. But no man is sinless. No man is sinless. But the God-man, Jesus Christ. We all need the Lord. Jesus, who is our high priest and is better than Aaron, didn't need his sins forgiven. Can I get an amen? Like Aaron. Why? Because Jesus is sinless. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to read verse 26 and 27. Because remember... A sacrifice had to be made for Aaron's sin, who is the high priest, who is a picture of Jesus. But we're going to find here in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 27, that our high priest is sinless. Our Lord Jesus is sinless. Let us start here in verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, speaking of Jesus, who is holy harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Wow. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Do you see the difference between him and the high priest Aaron? The high priest Aaron needed a sacrifice. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. He was sinless, holy, undefiled, separate from sinners, otherly. Sin never touched him. Sinless. And the Bible says that our high priest is also the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And our high priest died in our place. Their high priest in the Old Testament didn't die in their place. A bull died in his place. But our Lord Jesus died in our place. Amen. That is the joy and the wonder of the gospel. God made flesh to die for sinners. What a wonderful thing. Also keep in mind that it was Aaron who made the young bull or the golden calf in Exodus 32. Do you remember that? So it could very well be that God had Aaron slaughter a young bull, just like the scripture says here. It says, take for yourself a young bull in verse 2 and slaughter that thing. It could very well be that this was the payment for Aaron's sin in chapter 32. And by the way, a bull was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, the seventh month on the tenth day of every year. A bull was slaughtered. And so that was a reminder, not only to Aaron, but to the people, it could be a reminder that they had sinned against God by calling this Apis, this Egypt, Egyptian golden bull god, Yahweh. And so it was a constant reminder of their sin. The death of the animal was a reminder of their sin. The animal itself was a reminder of their sin. I'm sure every time they pulled the bull up, they thought, man, this looks very much like the golden calf we made in chapter 32 we got to kill right now, right? So it was a constant reminder, and I think that's the reason, or one of the reasons why God chose a young bull for Aaron to kill. 
Bulls were offered as sacrifices every day, as burnt offerings, which can also serve again as an ongoing reminder for all the people, because again, they all participated in this false worship, in this golden calf worship. It's very possible that that's one of the reasons why bulls were offered continually. I also find it interesting that the sin offering was a young bull again and not a lamb. Again, on the Day of Atonement, they, they offered a bull because Jesus is the ultimate sin offering and he's known not as the bull of God who takes away the sins of the world, but as the what? As the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I just kind of thought that was interesting. Also, a bull was offered for Aaron's sin, but lambs in the burnt offerings were offered for the people. So a bull for Aaron, a lamb, a goat, and a little calf for the people. Jesus is the lamb that died for the people. Pretty awesome. It was the prescribed animal sacrifices that connected holy God with sinful man. It took blood or death or innocent animals to pay for our sins and to connect us with God. You see, some people don't understand that. I remember a guy once told me, who does God think he is? Killing all of these animals, all these poor innocent animals. And I looked at him and said, if it wasn't them, it'd be you, buddy. So it's either that bull or you get on the altar yourself and have your throat slit for your own sins. That changed everything real quick. And then I told him, and not only that, but after you kill this animal, you get to enjoy its meat and have a cookout with God. Now, do you understand why animals took our place? Because God was being good. Amen. It was either the animals or the people. I don't mind an animal taking my place if I was in the Old Testament. And I am so grateful that the Lord took my place to pay for my sins because I could not do it. Amen? I could not do it. And so this is a beautiful picture. It's very bloody, very messy, very loud, I'm sure. But it was a beautiful picture of God connecting with people, with sinners. And so in the Old Testament, it was the blood of animals that connected them with God because it was death. Animals died paid for their sin. They were able to come to God now because the sin was paid for. The, the wall, in a sense, was temporarily taken down. You come to me now, right? And so, but in the New Testament, as you know, we were brought near to God the Father through Jesus. We find in Ephesians 2.13, it says, but now in Christ Jesus, not animals, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross made it possible for you to come to God by faith and for Him to open His arms and receive you through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the blood do? The blood allows you to draw near to God. That's what it does, church. That's what it does. It says here, then Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them. That's in verse 22. Aaron pronounced a blessing on the people for, for coming together as one before the Lord in worship. It was Aaron's way of saying, good job, folks. Thumbs up, approval. I'm joyful. I'm happy. We all did our part. Me and my sons did the right thing. God was pleased. The bull was consumed. The burnt offerings too. You guys are all here. It all went really well. And so he, he blessed the people. What a beautiful picture. It's possible that Aaron pronounced the priestly blessing found in Numbers 6, 24 and 26. I'll read it to you. It could be that he said this, so you can kind of imagine. He just got done sacrificing these animals, and now he's going to say these words to these, to these people, right? He says this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I don't know about you, but I like that blessing. I want God's face shining down on me. In the Hebrew, that means that God looks down and he smiles big on his children. I like that. I like that. Or we can, also see a, a, we can also see a New Testament blessing by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 14, where it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus 
and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The Apostle Paul says, I pray the blessing of the presence of the triune God with you always. Now listen to me. What great blessing, what greater blessing is there than that? If I say, hey, I hope you get a job next week, pretty cool. I hope you get a car next week, not bad. I hope you're, you know, your ailment goes away. That's pretty cool. But for me to say, I pray that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is a part of your daily life forever. I mean, there's no greater blessing than that. The man is saying, I pray that all that God is, is on your side. Well, it's better than a car, better than a house, better than healing. What is better than God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Absolutely nothing. And so Aaron does this to bless the people. And by the way, every good pastor genuinely desires the absolute best for his congregation, right? As I was going through this, I thought about myself. And I just thought in my mind and my heart, Lord, I am very grateful for the fellowship we have. I desire the absolute best for all of you. Like get all of Christ. Get all of His wisdom. Get all of His joy. Get all the spiritual blessings that are from heaven that are yours. I think to myself, Lord, I want you to bless their socks off. Well, let them keep their socks as they need them, right? But you get my point. That's what I pray. I pray that each and every one of you are blessed to the core by God and nothing less. That you are victorious in every area of your life. That you are wise in every area of your life. That you shine brighter than the stars in the night in this dark world. Listen, I want you to experience joy. I want you to feel a sense of peace and pleasure. In God's presence, in God's, in God's near presence, everything, everything that is, that is from God, everything that is good, I desire that for each and every one of you tonight. I really do. And nothing less. Nothing less than that. And so we see that with Aaron. I'm sure that's the heart he expressed, and so did, so did Moses. But something much bigger than mere men blessing men is hidden here in verse 22. Why? Because Aaron is a type of Christ. Aaron is a type of Christ. And it says there in verse 23, Bless them and came down from offering the sin offering. Now if you read that, you would just think, ah, oh, no big deal, it's Aaron, he's kind of just you know, saying a few blessed words for the people as he comes down from doing his work. But we need to understand that this is a picture of Jesus blessing us on the cross, right? Then coming down from the cross to make it a reality. Aaron coming down from the altar is a picture of Jesus dying on the cross, coming down from the cross and being raised to glory and blessing your life. That's what it is. And what do we find in Ephesians 1.3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Not just on earth, it says, in heavenly places in who? In Christ. Every spiritual blessing is yours, church. Every spiritual blessing. We're talking about stuff that is eternal. We're talking about all the heavenly blessings like being a child of God, being adopted into the family of God, being given eternal life, being seated at the right hand with Christ in glory. Every spiritual blessing is yours in Christ. So yeah, Aaron pronounced a few blessings on these people, but Jesus Christ, the better Aaron, the better high priest, has given you every blessing that you will ever need for all of eternity. I don't know about you. But that makes me rejoice. Because just when I thought I didn't have anything, I found I have everything and more in Christ. Amen? And I love that he says heavenly places, because he's like, this is further than this little globe that we're all living on. The true Christian is beyond blessed in Christ. It says, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. That was the next, next thing said there. 
in verse 23. This is a picture of how we can, cannot bless people. Listen to me closely. We cannot bless people unless we are shut up with God in private first. Well, of course, he went into the tabernacle to teach Aaron how to like work, work the bread and do a few other things, I'm sure. But they spent a little one-on-one -on -one time with God before they went out again. And I want you to know that they were able to bless the people because, but because they were blessed by God first. Listen to me. Anyone who does ministry without connecting with Jesus daily is a weak Christian. Listen, there are certain things that God will not do in us and through us simply because we will not tarry with the Lord in private prayer. And so that's a picture where Aaron and Moses go in with God, come out, bless the people. I'm telling you, go in with God, come out, bless the people around you. You want to bless the people around you? You, you can only do that if you spend time with God. Why? Because in spending time with God, he gives you of himself. That's what he does. He, he literally gives you of himself, of his nature, of his way of thinking, of his way of speaking. Guess what? You start to bless everyone around you. Why? Because you're living like God. You're talking like God. You're thinking like God. Like, dude, where, where'd you come from? Some quiet time with Jesus this morning, my man. You know? I mean, what else are you going to say? You didn't get the stuff on your own, that's for sure. You got it from the Lord. And so did these men. And so then again, we cannot bless anyone truly unless we spend time with God. Our power comes from connecting with the Lord in private. And this goes for all of us, not just ministry leaders. This goes for everyone. It says, Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came down from before the Lord and consumed and burned the offering and the fat on the altar. So again, here we see a jaw-dropping display of God's pleasure. God is pleased. God was pleased. And he approved it and proved it by accepting the offering by fire. Now, I would have you know the scene here. I know some of you are thinking, and we're still doing chapter 10. Chapter 10 is way shorter. But listen, listen up. <laughs> what happened here was, this is a glorious scene. It's kind of like an explosion in a way. I mean, this is way better than the 4th of July, folks. So what happened was, God was in a form of fire pillar, right? Standing there in the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the place of worship. And I believe that maybe from the top of that pillar, he shot out a big fireball. Everybody in the camp saw it. I, I guarantee you, it says all the people saw it. People just were like, what in the world, right? Or, or the fireball came from the bottom, from the tabernacle itself, from the Holy of Holies, a fireball shooting out, going through the veil without burning it like the fiery bush, going through the holy place and just consuming that sin offering or the burnt offering. And so however it was, it was very, very spectacular. And it was God's way of saying, I approve. I'll take that. I like it. You did it my way. I approve. And anytime we do something that honors God because we do it according to his word, it's as though he says, I'll take it. I approve of it. Right? Yeah, we don't get the spectacular fireball, but do you want to get burned up? I don't. <laughs> a friend of mine, his name is Tony, just the other day, they had a, a pit for trash. And it turns out that it was too hollow. And they put the gasoline in there. He says when he lit it, it just blew up. His wife was inside the house. She thought it was an explosion. He said it just blew up and the fire went really high, burned the trees. And a fireball came out and it burned the side of his leg. He's got a third degree burn and the shape looks like Africa. I said, God's trying to tell you something, buddy. But anyway... Um, <laughs> That's really what happened. But, but anyway, that's, I guess that was besides the point. But there was a fireball in that story too. But he's fine. He's okay. And he's healing just fine. But we see here that God accepted the offering. He blessed it. He consumed it. The people were excited. So was he. This was a very stunning time. 
And again, the sheer force of God's power and presence made people fall, like made people fall. I mean, they wanted to, but the fireball helped. You know what I mean? The fireball helped. The people fell on their faces. They worshiped his greatness. They worshiped his greatness. And, I want, and what have you know what the Bible says, that the glory of God is seen in the person of Christ. He is far better than a billion fireballs. He is far more greater than anything and anyone. And there's no one more beautiful or better than him. And if you want to be blown away, take some more time spending time with him and looking at him through scripture. So this too is a picture of God being pleased by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross when he raised him from the dead. Jesus was a sacrifice, wasn't he on the cross? What did God do? He took him home. What did the fireball do? Pretty much took and consumed that offering. In the same way, we know that God the Father was pleased by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because he took him home. Didn't let him stay in the tomb for too long, three days and no more. Why? Because God said, I'm pleased, approved, come home. He did it. Beautiful thing. Again, there's so much here. I'll go a little faster. God consumed sacrifices like this only five times in the entire Bible. Where he sends fire and consumes the, the offering that's there on the altar. He does it once with Moses and Aaron and the people here in Leviticus chapter 9. He does it with Gideon in Judges chapter 6. He does it with Manoah, which is Samson's dad, in Judges 19. He does it with King David in 1 Chronicles 21. And he does it with King Solomon, King David's son. In 2 Chronicles 7, 1, and he does it one last time with Elijah, right? We're all very familiar with that story in 1 Kings chapter 18, where the false priests of Baal have a showdown with the one true God, Yahweh, and his prophet Elijah. The fire comes down and burns that thing up. Let us read Leviticus chapter 10. I'll say a few things and we're done. Your subtitle may read, The Profane Fire of Nadab and Abihu. His name should have been Nabad, not Nadab. He was really bad. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane. Your version may say strange. Profane fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them. That's the key. Which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying. Remember, there's a jaw-dropping display of God's pleasure in chapter 9. Now there's a jaw-dropping display of God's displeasure in chapter 10. And he says this, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. What was he telling Aaron? Your sons shamed my name by not doing it my way. And the people, and the people saw it, the people will hear it. And so then... Nadab and Abihu didn't glorify God. So Aaron held his peace. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be extremely difficult. I mean, if God just sent a fireball down and consumed Blue and, David, uh, Blue and Damon for being little knuckleheads, that'd be hard. That'd be, that'd be a hard pill to swallow. And I'm sure that Aaron loved his boys like you love your kids. So try to put his shoes on for a moment. But what does that tell you about God? God is greater than us and the sins of our children. And he will be honored and respected by everyone, whether we like it or not. And for unbelievers, the fire burns hot and it burns forever. For believers, sometimes the Lord might just take us out a little early for being knuckleheads. All right, let's keep going. Verse 4, then Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, these were the pallbearers. They got a new job right away. And the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron. So these were family members. Obviously, they're all the tribe of Levi. And said to them, come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary of the camp. Man, what a, what a sad scene. Imagine. 
I mean, something so awesome just got done happening. Now something so terrible just got done happening. Five, so they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp. And Moses, as Moses has said, six, and Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons. So they had two other brothers. Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die. And wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. Let them cry. That's what he's saying. Let them cry. Seven, you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you, and they did according to the word of Moses. Boy, I don't know about you, but those are some serious words. Se serious words. Don't cry or you too will die. That's what he told him. Hold your tears. Don't rent your clothes. Don't show any type of mourning for your sons. Honor me above them. I don't know about you, but that's, that's pretty tough. But doesn't it sound like Jesus? Anyone who loves father or mother, brother or sister, son or daughter, or even their own life more than me is not worthy of me. Well, of course, it's the same God. Can I get an amen? Verse 8, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you. So no, no dos equis, no Jose Cuero for these guys. When you go into a tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. A lot of dying going on here, possibly. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations. That you may distinguish, this is the reason, between holy and the unholy. And between unclean and the clean. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has commanded has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. And Moses spoke to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons who were left. Take the grain offering that remains of the offerings made by fire to the Lord and eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place because it is your due and your sons due of the sacrifices made by fire to the Lord. For so I have been commanded. The breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering you shall eat in a clean place. You, your sons and your daughters with you, for they are your due and your sons due, which are given from the sacrifices of peace offerings of the children of Israel. So in other words, he's telling them, look, have a little cookout with your family. Here, take this food with you. 15. The thigh of the heave offering and the breast of the wave offering, they shall bring with the offerings of fat and made by fire to offer as a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be yours and your sons with you by a statue forever, as the Lord has commanded. Then Moses made careful inquiry about the goat of the sin offering, and there it was, burnt up. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, who were left, saying, Why? Well, maybe they were hurting still. <laughs> maybe they were still stunned. Look what just happened to our brothers. We're not even hungry. Lost our appetite. 17, why have you not eaten the sin offering in a holy place since it is most holy and God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. See, its blood was not brought inside the holy place. In other words, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, boys. Indeed, you should have eaten it in a holy place as I commanded. And Aaron said to Moses, look, this day they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. Their dad stands up. He's like, I got to say something about my sons. They're already broken, so I better say something. Before the Lord and such things have befallen me, if I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? So when Moses heard that, he was content. In other words, he was like, I don't even know if it was right for us to even eat at this time, seeing what just happened. We're all just kind of confused right now. Like, just be patient with us. Moses is like, all right, I get you. And so he let him slide. They messed up. He let him slide. <clears throat> I'll be real quick. 
I've got allergies still, by the way. I believe that Nadab and Abihu took it upon themselves to light the fire in the censer. This was a little container. Could have been like a metal container. Uh, this was actually made of gold, a golden container where they would put the incense, right? And, and, and they would pray to the Lord and the incense and the smoke would rise. Well, anyways, they, I believe that they lit this fire their own way. I think that was it. They just, they, they lit this fire their own way. In, in other words, see, they were prescribed to grab a coal from the altar, right? Where the animal was sacrificed. It's a picture of Christ. It's a picture of the cross. Whatever you do, you grab from God's word. You grab from Christ. You do what is right. So anyway, so he, he grabs a piece of coal. You're supposed to grab a piece of coal from there and then put that in the incense to start a fire. But they didn't do that. And we know that that's the, the prescribed way because it's written here in Numbers 16, 46. Moses tells Aaron to take a censer, put fire in it, listen, from the altar. Put incense on it. So in other words, they just possibly did ministry their own way. It was a little shortcut. Why walk all the way to the altar right there when we get light up our own fire, boys? <laughs> pull, out your, pull out your lighter, Nadab. They were supposed to go to the altar to get the coal. Maybe they were lazy. Maybe they were careless. Maybe they thought, ah, what, what's lighting this fire a different way going to do to God? Well, you don't know God. If you think that you can just do whatever you want, do your own life, do life the way you, you want to do it, you don't know God, right? And so that's what these guys did. They just lit this thing up their own way and they were barbecued on the spot. I don't mean to make light of it, but hey, they, they were. They were just, they were toast. And for this reason, Nadab and Abihu lost their job on the spot. They were fired. Literally. <laughs> Burnt to a crisp. <laughs> I know, I thought you guys would laugh sooner, but that's cool. Um, listen, <laughs> so listen. So they were burnt up, they were done, why? Because they did ministry their own way. I believe that's what it was. And so I wanna encourage you this evening, don't do life and don't do ministry your own way. Don't do it with your own attitude. Don't do it with your, you know, your own way, just whatever, however God teaches us in his word, we do our best to line up with the book, with God's heart, God's will, in order for God to approve and bless our actions. Amen? God is a serious God. Yes, He is loving. Yes, He is good. Yes, He is kind. Yes, His face lights up with joy over His children. But there are times, church, where God is like, I do not like that at all. And I'm going to take your life or your leg or your house or something. God is going to discipline His children. God's glory is at stake here. And people are watching our lives. And we're connected to the glory of God. I mean, to be, to be given that responsibility that the way I live, act, think, and speak reflects on my God. He is saying, you're my representative. Represent me well. I've given you my word. I've given you some men to preach. I've given you my spirit. Reflect me well in this world so the people can see that there is a God in heaven and he lives in you amen hebrews 12 20 and 29 referring no doubt to nadab and abihu i'm sure that the hebrew that the writer of hebrew is thinking of nadab and abihu hebrew 12 hebrews 12 20 and 29 i'll read it to you therefore since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and fear. What Nadab and Abihu didn't do, right? For our God is a consuming fuego. You know he was thinking about Nadab and Abihu. You know he was when he was writing this. 
Why? Because they did not honor God. They did not fear God. What they did was not done in reverence, was not done in godly fear. By the way, it shows us here, let us have grace. For what reason? To serve God acceptably. Grace is for us to serve God acceptably. It's what He's given us to please Him. Can I get an amen? He says, for our God is a consuming fire. You don't believe that? Just read Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 again. Our God is a consuming fire. He burnt these guys up. That's what that verse is pointing to. God burns people up who do not take Him serious. You might say, well, what kind of God is that? Sounds like a tyrant to me. No, what we don't understand is He is more holy than our minds can wrap around. Listen to me. You and I are not bothered by sin like God is. There is sin going on all around the world today that our eyes cannot even bear. Children are being molested. People are being stabbed. Houses are being robbed. Wives are being beaten to death right now as we speak. Christians are being put in prison. We're not really bothered by that. We might be a little bit, but not like God. We're not as offended as God is. We might be bothered, but we're not as offended as God is. You and I, we benefit from sin. We do something wrong and at times we like it. God never benefits from sin. He never benefits from sin. To show Himself glorious and powerful in that sense, yes. But do you see what I'm saying? Our God is holy, holy, holy. And if God decides to take someone out early, it's His prerogative. And God only does, does what is right. Sin does not offend us nearly as much as it offends Him. I mean, our minds can't even fathom the difference of offense between us and God. It, it, it's laughable. It really is. How, how much we're offended by sin? It's laughable compared to how God is offended by sin. And how much sin He sees happening every day, all day, all the time. And so then, yes, God is a consuming fire. Yes, there's a real hell. Yes, there is a fireball that came down and burnt these dummies up. Yes. Why? Because our God is worthy. <laughs> our God is worthy of all our reverence, of all of our obedience, of all our worship, of all our gratitude and thankfulness. Amen? Amen? It says strange fire. Strange means other than or turn aside. It also means unacceptable. So it was just unacceptable. God doesn't like ministers to take shortcuts. God doesn't like lazy. God doesn't like careless in ministry work. God wants us to take Him serious. Why? Because He is worthy. Lest we think that God only kills off disobedient saints in the Old Testament or Christians, He also does it in the New Testament. Yes, He does it in the New Testament. We find in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, right? They lie, they lie to the Holy Spirit about how much they kept back and how much they sold the land for. They were trying to compete with Joseph, right? Barnabas, most likely. So it was like a little competition. They were lying. And, the, and, and God gave them a chance, and they still lied, and, and God struck them dead. During the offering collection, on, 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 a, on a Sunday morning at church, most likely a Sunday morning at church, in front of everybody, struck one dead, and then the other. And it says that their body, bodies were dragged out of the, of the church, just like we see the bodies that were dragged out of the tabernacle. Interesting, right? This is the trippy part. Before that, it was like a revival explosion. People were coming to Christ left and right. He kills Ananias and Sapphira. Everybody's like, I'm staying away from those people. It was almost like the revival stopped. Because the people, because God wanted the people to know that he's worthy of all respect. And so the people from that point on, if you read, they were afraid of Christians. And they stayed away from them because their God kills that, that, that's, that's what happened. And I think it's because God didn't want funny business happening in the church. I really believe that. 
And so we see God doing that. And then we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where people are disrespecting the Lord's Supper. And the Lord, it says here that he, he kills them off, he strikes them with sickness, or he strikes them with weakness. Just for not respecting the Lord's Supper. Do you see how we don't see things the way God does? The Lord said, like, you disrespect me and you disrespect my house and you disrespect the supper here. I will either strike you with sickness, I will make you physically weak, or I'll take you home early. I will do one of the three. I mean, you and I kind of don't really like that. But that's the way God operates. Why? Because God is ultimately about His glory. Yes, He loves you. Yes, you are still super blessed. Yes, you have every promise He's ever made to you. But if for some reason we are, we are not living like we should, God just may turn off the lights. He still does that today. We just don't know who He does it to. And we can't know. And that's okay. I'm going to finish with the last two thoughts. Followed by two more thoughts. I'm just kidding. Last two thoughts. He says, do not uncover your heads. Do not tear your clothes lest you die. So again, if Aaron and his sons would have mourned Nadab and Abihu's death, it would have seemed as though the Lord did something wrong. And Aaron's sons did something right. No tears for you men. They disrespected me and everybody needs to know it. And if you cry, you're going to make me look bad when they were the bad ones. Don't cry. We told them. And they held back their tears. Then he tells them, do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. Why? So you're able to distinguish the holy from the unholy. The clean from the... What happens to a guy who drinks? Be smoking up and drinking up. He's impaired. He's intoxicated. He's not, he's not, he doesn't have correct judgment anymore. He doesn't have his mind intact. And so how is it that Christians and leaders can be drinking and doing things they shouldn't be doing and still honor God in everything they do? It's impossible. Why? Because the drug is going to alter your mind, alter your attitude, alter your thoughts, alter your desires, and ultimately you're going to disrespect God, right? That's what alcohol does. We all know that. Well, most of us know that, right? Some of you are like, I'm kind of offended by that, brother. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we all been there, done that, right? So anyway, lastly, some scholars believe that Nadab and Abihu went in there, in the tabernacle, drunk. That's what some scholars believe. Because he's telling them here, don't be getting drunk. Some scholars say, hey, he's connecting that warning with what happened to their brothers. That's a possibility. It's a possibility they lit that thing while they were drunk. I don't know. But um, I think it's the first one in my opinion, but that's a possibility. Lastly, leaders are most accountable and therefore shouldn't drink because drinking makes us impaired. We find that in, uh, in the book of Timothy. Ephesians 5, 18, last verse, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a command from the Lord, right? Don't be drunk with wine. What does that mean? Don't be controlled by the drink but be controlled by the Spirit. That word filled can be like filling a cup, but it, it could also be like wind filling a sail, a sail on a sailboat. Don't let the beer or the drinking or the liquor move you like wind moves a sailboat. Let the Holy Spirit direct your life instead. How are you led by the Holy Spirit? By His writings. There is no other way that we can be led by the Spirit. The Spirit is connected to His writings. The more you know God's Word, the more you can be led by the Spirit. Got that? <laughs>